Hey, Colin. Hey, Matt. How are you? <laughs> Everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. We're really happy to see you. I have on stage with me Colin Woodward, who is a lawyer. A bum, web, bum, a web three bum, lawyer. Bum. So I got, a, I got some questions about this. I think it's going to be a really interesting talk, actually. Um, but Colin, we'll start with, who are you, what do you do, and how did you get here? Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on this awesome venue. It really came to, together really well, and it's uh, a really impressive kind of, you know, feat that you've done here. So thank you, sir. You came. Colin was here two days ago when it was not this. Yes, <laughs> lots of work was done in very short order. I promise you all. A uh, bit of context there. Um, so I got involved in the Web three and well, the Web three space back in 2017. Um, and, you know, uh, at the top of that market, you know, made lots of money and then quickly lost it all. Uh, but I was immediately attracted to, you know, the promises, which were often way too lofty, of blockchain back in 2017. So even, um, you know, once the, the winter bear market started, I kept learning, kept listening to podcasts and everything, and kept educating myself on the underlying technology and, and all that stuff. Um, Right after COVID started in 2020, I was introduced to the concept of NFTs via Nifty Gateway and NBA Top Shots. And at first I was extremely confused, but again, really intrigued by the idea of, you know, ownership rights on the internet, these digital assets that, you know, could be, uh, that have these, these components of provability and scarcity and provenance to them. Um, and so um, I didn't dismiss it. I, I dug a little bit further and really got addicted to the idea of NFTs. Started, you know, mingling in the, the Twitter and Discord circles, trying to get more information about NFTs and what the landscape looked like and everything. Um, eventually, I, uh, I came across a, uh, a guy that runs a venture fund out of the UK and we really hit it off. And uh, he invited me into this group that he was running of lots of the Web3 founders at the time. That's where I met uh, Jimmy, and we really hit it off. And, um, you know, uh, I eventually agreed to, to join him and, and help, uh, you know, start a Web3 company just about a, a year ago. So it's been quite the journey. Uh, to me, that is incredible because the. Uh risk tolerance of other lawyers that I know is not always akin yeah. to the crypto market. Yeah, certainly not. But, you know, um, when you're younger, not young, but younger, you know, you, you can take more risks and your, your risk appetite naturally should be a bit higher. Um, you know, kind of reach out there because um, to a large extent, the safe thing will always be there. And that was kind of the mentality that I took and, you know, Admittedly, leaving my very safe job at a law firm, uh, taking a pay cut, and taking a dive, you know, headfirst into to Web3 and NFTs, so. That's awesome. Okay, so the meat and potatoes, the hard stuff, some of what we really want to hear. Um, things have changed recently. Terra's, Terra's not doing so good. Luna's yeah. not really there. There have been a lot of legislation, a lot of bills introduced, a lot mm -hmm. of legal stuff happening. What do you see changing, or what do you see happening? How do, how do you interpret it? How about that? Sure, so um, yeah, lots has happened very recently, and I think lots more is going to come over the subsequent weeks, months, and, and years here. And I think we're finally starting to see meaningful uh, regulation enter this space via you know, several different avenues. One is executive orders, like the one that Biden issued in uh, March of this year. Um, another is the recent um, bipartisan bill introduced by Senators Loomis and Gillibrand. Um, another is regulatory enforcement, like what the SEC is constantly pursuing against companies like BlockFi and what I think is coming against Doquan and uh, Terraform Labs, as Matt alluded to. Uh, the fourth is criminal prosecutions, unfortunately, like what we have seen recently um, with Nate Chastain and OpenSea. And so these kind of four different uh, avenues of, of finally bringing uh, regulatory clarity and, uh, and precedent to the Web3 and NFT space is uh, certainly on our horizon here. It's, it's at our doorstep, really. So 
All right, so remember everyone, what follows from here is not legal advice. Not advice of any kind, actually, yes. What do we, uh, so what do we do? Seriously, the, some of this thing, some of this, for, for example, the bill that was just recently introduced um, will have decently far-reaching implications, especially for the NFT market, right? So we're here, this is an NFT gallery. There are a lot of creators and artists and folks who are learning, who have been here and doing this for a long time. How might you interpret some of those things for the everyday person, and how could we, how could we manage or, or understand them in a way that helps what we do every day in terms of our collecting and our, our uh, even creation of some of those pieces? Yeah, sure. So kind of the, the TLDR of the Loomis and Gillibrand bipartisan bill is that they are seeking to uh, classify digital assets, which include NFTs, as commodities not securities that would be subject to the purview of the SEC, right? So um, should this, this new crypto bill pass, um, the CFTC would be regulating all these different digital assets, whether they're cryptocurrencies that, that operate um, more in a monetary fashion, or if they are digital assets like NFTs that, you know, kind of uh, prescribe property rights over a particular um, item or, or whatever it may be, right? Um, and, and so, Typically, commodities are things like oil and wheat and not securities like, you know, the, the average stock or, um, uh, you know, other kind of investment contract like that, right? Um, and so that is kind of the, the chief framework for which they are trying to introduce kind of a, a comprehensive um, new framework that would cover all things digital assets. So that's good. That's good in some respects. Um, there's, there's lots of initial concerns around this proposal, though, because the CFTC is actually one of the least funded governmental organizations that we have, right? So putting the onus on the CFTC to then regulate all of these digital assets when it doesn't have the, the people power and the resources to do so is, you know, a, a very big question, right? Um, on the other hand, we have the SEC, right, which is, in my opinion, way too overly aggressive uh, and this primarily, you know, stems from Gary Gensler, who, who is taking a very enforcement-heavy uh, approach as opposed to kind of more of a uh, uh, cooperative approach to, you know, talking with these projects and with these companies and finding out more about the nuance of, of what they're doing in the space and everything. So That's an interesting way to, to put it. So actually, I won't pull on this thread too much longer, but I'm interested in your perspective on regulation. So there, again, in the NFT communities in particular, have been scams and rug pulls and um, uh, insider trading, if you will. Another thing we'll touch on, for sure. Yeah, so, or maybe that's a good segue. Yeah. In, in one instance, uh, I in particular, I'm not necessarily always for regulation, but the Wild Wild West is a dangerous place. And it's interesting that these bills are being introduced. So, for example, you said to a department that has no funding. On one hand, I might say, like, ha, ah, cool. On the other hand, I might say, that sounds awful. Why would they do that? It doesn't actually make any sense. Where do you think regulation fits into things like NFT markets in the coming future? Well, so presumably, you know, if the, the FTC were to take um, ownership over all digital assets, there would need to be a framework for funding it in a significant way. Um, to, to give it the resources to actually do its job and, you know, do what uh, these, these two senators um, kind of have identified as the primary objectives, which is investor protection, uh, and then also, you know, financial inclusivity and, um, you know, making sure that, that money laundering is, is tracked and uh, national security is protected, right? Makes sense. So segueing into Nate, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Nate, uh, Nate got himself into quite the pickle there. Um, unfortunately, I think the SEC is, um, is out to take that case all the way, uh, potentially through trial and make an example of him. Um, and, you know, I, I guess like perhaps the crudest way to put it is he might become the Martha Stewart of NFTs. Um, it, 
it doesn't it doesn't look good for for Nate. Uh, he's been charged with money laundering and wire fraud. The whole kind of concept around this is that he used the confidential business information of OpenSea. That being, you know, the items that would be featured on OpenSea's homepage. Um, he used that information to trade against other people in the marketplace and against his own employer and received a, a personal benefit in the form of ETH and then, you know, obviously USD. Um, so, uh, you know, he's, and then he used a bunch of anonymous wallets to cover up his transactions. Uh, he used some anonymous OpenSea accounts in order to kind of cover up his tracks. And that is kind of where the, the money laundering uh, aspect of, of all the charges come into play. It's actually a good point that you bring up. One of the fundamental tenets of using blockchain technology is that it is, in fact, a public ledger. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, I think enforcement might be easier, depending on the regulations that are passed. Yeah, for, for anyone that, that needs to hear this, um, conducting illicit activity on a blockchain is a really bad idea. They're, they're public ledgers. And, you know, whether, um, you know, in, in bad activity and bad actors are going to be rooted out, whether it's by, you know, anons on crypto Twitter, which is actually the origin of how Nate Chastain's activity came to light, or whether it's through, you know, regulatory or law enforcement agencies themselves, right? And one thing we have to keep in mind is that uh, the U.S. government is actually contracted with some of the best blockchain forensics companies like Chainalysis. Um, and they regularly use them to prosecute criminal cases. Um, so, yeah, conducting illicit activity on a blockchain is a very poor idea, and you are more likely than not going to be pinched, um, and there's just no getting around that, so. Makes sense. Notes, that one was legal advice for anyone who's listening. Don't do bad things on the blockchain. <laughs> yeah. So, um, kind of on that note, one of the, for, for NFT projects and NFT companies, for, for digital asset companies in general, really, I think one of the best pieces of advice is to make sure that you're staying proactive and you have in place internal, you know, asset trading policies, uh, buying policies that you both, uh, that you update, that you enforce, and that you track to make sure that your employees are kind of abiding by the, the spirit of the law and, um, and making sure that they don't get mixed up in any illicit activity, right? Um, and that protects both the company and hopefully it protects the employees as well because expectations are set clear and they know exactly what they should or shouldn't do, right? Now, of course, I'm sure many of you are sitting there and you're like, well, Nate didn't need a policy to know that what he was doing was you know, not great. And that's true, right? Like lots of activity on its face is probably a really bad idea and potentially criminal conduct. Um, fortunately for OpenSea, they actually did have a policy in place, which is one of the main tools that the Department of Justice is using against Nate in that case, so. That's awesome. So backing off to uh, something different, the, the crash of Terra Luna and the stable coins. What do you think is going to be the ultimate result of that as it pertains to these ERC-20 tokens? Yep, so I think that the SEC is already very quickly building a case against Doquan and against Terraform Labs. Um, the problem, the, the primary problem being that Terraform Labs is a Singapore-based company. Doquan is a, a citizen of South Korea, right? So in law parlance, we have this issue of personal jurisdiction, right? These are, this is a corporation and um, an individual, they're located outside the US. So what gives um, the SEC the jurisdiction to, you know, send subpoenas to Do Kwon and his company or compel Do Kwon to, to show up for questioning or, you know, any kind of related activity surrounding a typical um, uh, criminal or securities investigation, right? Um, what happened very recently, though, was that a district court in New York actually ruled that the, thank you, Jimmy, that the SEC has, jurist, has personal jurisdiction over Do Kwon and Terraform Labs uh, by virtue of their, um, their commercial activity that touches 
individuals that reside here in the United States, right? So, um, and, and that was with respect to this thing called Mirror Protocol, which is a DeFi platform that's run within the Terra ecosystem. Um, essentially, it allows um, uh, stocks to be pegged to certain coins, and then you can trade on the value of stocks within this Mirror Protocol. Uh, the, D the, um, the SEC is already investigating Doquan and Terraform Labs over the conduct of Mirror Protocol. They got this, this piece of precedent now from uh, a US district court in New York. Um, it's not a strong piece of precedent because it's just a district court as opposed to an appellate court or, or something higher of that nature. But I think it is the groundwork for the SEC really trying to get in there and make Doquan accountable for the uh, enormous collapse of the Luna and UST ecosystem. Um, unfortunately, we're talking about like between 40 and 60 billion dollars worth of predominantly retail and institutional value gone from that. So, so I've, I've done a bit of reading on what, what happened and what they think specifically happened and the way that those stable coins uh, were structured and they're actually algorithmic stable coins. And so a, an interesting question that sort of came to my mind is each time you see a systematic failure in other industries, you often see tailwind reg uh, regulation that comes after. Uh, do you anticipate that they'll get technical and start looking at other algorithmic or otherwise stable coins? Yeah, I think algorithmic stable coins in particular are going to be targeted, right? Um, so uh, just kind of more, more context is that the stable coin industry is, is generally comprised of like three different types of stable coins. You have the algorithmic ones, right, which are only partially backed by some sort of underlying asset. Um, you have an over-collateralized stablecoin, which is something like USDC, right, where they have certain reserves in place um, above the actual amount of token issuance that they have out in the market or the float, right? And then you have um, uh, just a, a regular collateralized stablecoin, right? And so the over-collateralized and, and the collateralized are the two safest because in the event of a liquidation event or a death spiral, like what happened with Luna and Terra, um, you know, there's some sort of recourse for the holders of that token. Um, there's the underlying asset. Unfortunately, what, how Luna was set up, it was only partially backed by Bitcoin. Um, there were some uh, apparently very, very large whales that um, came up with a scheme to create a death spiral such that uh, the, the Terra fund was forced to sell Bitcoin to the market um, and that reduced the peg of UST to Luna and a death spiral ensued from there which ended up breaking the UST peg of $1 and caused a total ecosystem collapse. They're now trying to like fork the whole ecosystem and everything and, and whether that is going to be successful is uh, in my opinion highly doubtful but we will see. So you still wouldn't put your money there? Yeah, no. I, you know, I'm, you know to, to call crypto vanilla is kind of an oxymoron, but I'm kind of like a vanilla crypto person and that I primarily just do Bitcoin and Ethereum. There's that risk aversion. Yeah. We found it. Yeah, we found it. Yeah, yeah. Had to, had to get it out of me there. That's all right. That's awesome. So um, in terms of other headwinds or tailwinds that you see, inside the legal market. It's, it's super awesome to have your expertise and your lens for the crypto world right now. What do you think? Well, so there's kind of a third component that we haven't talked about yet, and that is, you know, regulation that's coming via SEC enforcement actions. Um, one of the biggest things that I think has happened over the last couple of months that perhaps went under the radar is the SEC settled with BlockFi for $100 million. Uh, the SEC was alleging that BlockFi was um, essentially, uh, so BlockFi was offering these things called interest-bearing accounts. You could have, say, USDC or ETH sit in your interest account, and then it would earn a set level of interest per day, which was paid out um, at the end of every month. Um, and essentially, it's just like passive yield. And it was the thing that, that really fueled um, a lot of these, these early DeFi platforms in 2020. Um, the SEC came in and, you know, 
was set on making an example of BlockFi. And they charged them with uh, essentially operating an unregistered securities platform. And it ultimately culminated in uh, BlockFi settling for $100 million. So a significant blow to all the corporations like BlockFi, like, like Coinbase actually. Coinbase was getting ready to launch, launch its, uh, its Lend product, right, which would operate in a similar fashion. Um, all of those crypto services and products were instantly, you know, instantly put the kibosh on um, because of this, this precedent. So, um, you know, and this is, this is Gary Gensler's MO right now. He wants to go in there, you know, swinging a hammer and, and making sure that, you know, he gets lots of press doing it. He has no interest in negotiating with folks in the Web3 space, unfortunately. Um, we hope that changes in the near future. Uh, but, but right now, um, he's, you know, he's out there shooting from the hip. Does anybody know Gary? Colin wants to meet him. <laughs> I don't really have that much interest in meeting Gary, to be honest. Got it. Yeah. This has been, a, this has been awesome. Does anyone, i uh, take a quick pause. Does anyone have any questions? Great. Do we have a traveling mic? No? I can be, I can be your traveler if you want. You want to travel? Hey guys, uh, my question is about uh, OpenSea and Nate Chastain. Was OpenSea, did they go too heavy handed on Nate and put him in tr too much trouble or were they required to do what they did in order to make sure that they didn't get in trouble in the future? Uh, you'll have to fill me in. What, what did OpenSea have Nate do? Well, no, what OpenSea did when they found out Nate uh, did his thing, they wrote a letter basically to the public and said, we've been covered insider trading, and they named Nate and they fired Nate very publicly. And that is probably why the DOJ caught wind of this and it prosecuted him. And to be clear, what Nate did was wrong. He does deserve some form of punishment. Uh, 20 years for 20 ETH seems a little bit out of bounds. So I'm just curious if you, if there was anything that uh, OpenSea could have done legally different that wouldn't have found Nate in the same situation he's in today. Yeah. You know, honestly, I'm not sure there's much that OpenSea could have done to change the situation. I agree that the crime is, or the punishment is, is going to be completely disproportionate to the crime here, right? But unfortunately, he has found himself in a position where um, he was the former head of product for effectively the largest NFT company on the planet and um, the DOJ is looking to make an example of somebody. Uh, this was, from all accounts, a, a fairly clear scheme of quote unquote insider trading of digital assets. And that's why the DOJ has come out you know, so heavy handed like this. They are, they are trying to set the stage and set precedent for the prosecutions that will likely follow from this. Um, and, you know, another thing is that I'm, I'm not sure much of the blame lies on OpenSea, other than the fact that perhaps there was uh, mis-messaging from them, uh, certainly around the term insider trading. I don't think that really had any place in a, in a public announcement or comment of any kind. Um, but I, I think with what the DOJ is primarily going to end up relying on here are the sleuths from crypto Twitter and all the work that they ended up doing far in advance of, you know, OpenSea really getting involved. Because it was like months, right? Between when crypto Twitter came out with this stuff like, hey, check out all this wallet transaction history. You know, we can link it up to this person and it uh, looks very bad. Um, and then, you know, uh, I know you and I have had lots of talks about, you know, the, the status of NFTs whether there'll be securities, whether there'll be commodities or something else like that. Um, and that's, that's where this new bill um, between Lummis and Gillibrand is very important. Um, it certainly makes far more sense in my mind that these assets are classified as commodities and not securities. However, um, and, and that is especially true if the asset itself is sufficiently decentralized in some way, right? However, some of these assets, I think, are likely securities and that, you know, the, the profits or potential profits are going to be derived from the work of others directly. And so NFT companies and 
in particular, NFT projects have lots of education to do on their own proactively to figure out ways in which they can, you know, decentralize the tokens from their company, um, put control and ownership of the tokens increasingly in the hands of their community members and away from them um, to kind of, you know, make sure the regulators understand that they are trying at least to be decentralized. Hey, um, my name's Dylan, and I have a, I don't know, maybe somewhat off-topic uh, question here, but we talked about stable coins, we've talked about NFTs, we haven't talked about this regulation, and uh, one of the most controversial parts of it, I believe, is that we're taking the coins from the L1 networks, such as Ethereum, and supposedly trying to make those into securities. Um, could you, I, I don't know, do you have an opinion on that or anything? You have a bit more background information you can offer on that at all? Well, it is bullshit that I may have read on the internet, at least potentially. So uh, if this is entirely novel, then uh, I believe maybe it's discredited at this point. <laughs> so is, is the question around um, whether like most L1 tokens are securities or? Okay, all right. Well, and, and really that depends on how the tokens originated, right? Um, we have, of course, like Bitcoin, which is a proof of work token, right? And there was no public presale or anything like that. I think it's the clearest form of a non-security in, in crypto, right? We have, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's clearly a commodity. There's, there's no arguable basis for anything other than calling it a commodity, I think. Um, well, either a commodity or, or perhaps an actual, um, you know, currency one of these days, maybe. Um, Ethereum is a bit different, right? They did have the presale. Although it is so decentralized right now that arguably all those concerns around whether it may have been a security back in, you know, was it 2016 or something like that, 2017, whenever the presale was. Um, I think that those security concerns and consumer protection concerns um, are, are probably outdated. It's not something that I think like the SEC could really have strong footing on if they were to go in and try and argue that, you know, they want to upend Ethereum because, you know, uh, frickin' six years ago they had a public sale, right? For all those other tokens, um, more likely than not, they have securities components. Um, because they are sufficiently centralized in that most of the tokens are held either by the, the corporate entity itself or a small group of VCs, right? Um, or perhaps the tokens promise some sort of yield, right, that is derived from the efforts of, of others, right? So it's very contextual. It really, really depends on, you know, which token we're talking about and the circumstances under which that token came to the market. Yeah. Hey, my name is Paul. I got a question for you about DAOs, if that's cool. Um, so the legal status of DAOs is interesting to me because you have, on one level, the basic notion of them being legally recognized as a co-op or a corporation proxy, uh, which is somewhat uncertain. And then you also have the legal liability for the people that are holding them and that they lack a lot of the liability protections that you would normally get. Yes, they do. So I know that a couple of states have started to bring in some legislation which allow you to have a kind of a, a state formed corporation that is then operated off of a DAO. I want to say Oregon or Wyoming. I can't remember exactly which state it was. Do you know where that's at right now? Is there progress happening? Is it going to be from states like those other states or more of them doing that? What do you, what do you think is going to happen there? Yeah. So the, the two states that have been kind of leading the charge on DAOs are, of course, Wyoming and Delaware, actually. I'm, I'm sure that lots more states are going to introduce like uh, DAO-specific you know, new proposals or DAO-like kind of proposals to create these new legal entities. Um, but all that, all that stuff is, is happening in kind of uh, very, uh, uh, a very splintered way because what you alluded to is correct. Each of the states is really coming up with its own framework for, you know, a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, and so each state is going to have its own particular um, rules, regulations, um, requirements for um, properly constructing a DAO within that state and operating it. Um, 
in large part, the, the DAO entity today is not as effective as it should be because of the first thing you mentioned, which is that effectively everyone that's part of a DAO is a general partner that is subject potentially to individual liability should that DAO be sued, right? So the safest way to participate in a DAO is actually through another entity of your own, like an LLC, right? You would make, you'd set up an LLC, and then you'd make that LLC a member of the DAO. That way, if there's anything that happens with that DAO, you have that limited liability protection of the LLC to fall back on. Um, and until we get that, you know, kind of a larger, perhaps even federal framework for, for DAOs, I'm not sure if federal makes sense actually, uh, because even limited liability companies have been pri predominantly handled on the state level. Um, but until we get some, some more clarity there, or at least a, a subset of states that are all kind of following the same standards and, um, and protocols there, um, we're not going to have tons of clarity, unfortunately, on DAOs. Uh, it's early for DAOs. DAOs have immense potential. Uh, they will play a gigantic part in the Web3 of tomorrow. But, but right now, we're just, like lots of you know, crypto and Web3 stuff, we're, we're in the early days. So. Just real quick, do you know how uh, long the uh, Delaware uh, uh, legislation on that, how far out? Is there any signs of when that might come along? Uh, Delaware has active DAO, um, yeah. Uh, oh, so that's uh, in place already. Construction, yeah, in place, okay. yes, cool. yes. And it's actually, in, in a lot of respects, more effective than, than, what di uh, than what Wyoming has to offer, so. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Yep. I'm not seeing any, yeah, I got one? Oh, yeah. So, you know, we're here in an NFT gallery. You know, NFT is a focus. Whether you're involved in a downer project, that was one of my questions. I thank you for answering that because, you know, you, you want to give, you want to serve, but you want to limit your or mitigate your exposure. But let's say, you know, you're launching an NFT project, you're involved in an NFT project, and you want to definitely, you know, over deliver and under promise, but you got to be mindful of how much utility do you actually deliver. Uh, and that's when, when I saw that bipartisan bill, you know, it could be away from the SEC, might be considered a commodity, but how can a project uh, owner best protect his or her community while also protecting themselves when it comes to over delivering value and offering massive utility far beyond what was initially promised? Very interesting question, and perhaps a, a million dollar question for lots of NFT projects out there. Um, it's actually less of a legal question, I think, and more of a, a business question. Um, it, you know, being innovative is, is very difficult in, in a space that's competitive as this, and is, you know, driving new pieces of innovation every day. So finding new ways to, you know, create utility that actually matches the uh, composition of your membership, right? and that makes sense within the, the ethos of the project is difficult and really it's, it's kind of a, a business thing that's up to the founders to really sit down, think hard on, and grind on, right? Um, and really the, the one like golden rule is never talk about price. All right, I think we got one more question from Pete and then, and then I got one in reserve for you too. Yeah, hey, uh, so going back to the CFTC conversation, um, understanding the route that the SEC has taken in many other situations, are, it seems like BS. I think Gillibrand and Loomis are making a power play. They've got dollars somewhere. It's absolutely a power play, yes, to, and, to dethrone the SEC and And, and frankly, raise at the end the of the CFTC. day, there's countries that are looking at using Bitcoin as a currency. Correct. So this makes absolutely no sense to me. I, I just thought I'd ask your real opinion and, and not legal advice. Yeah, no, this, this is at its core a, a power conflict between the CFTC and the SEC and, um, you know, uh, the senators that, you know, have ties to both organizations and, you know, going one level deeper, the monetary contributors, donors of those senators that end up, you know, proposing legislation like this, right? Um, 
So, and kind of as I, as I mentioned before, the fact that, that Lummis and Gillibrand want to kind of enshrine the CFTC as the, you know, the godfather of digital assets, when that organization has basically been gutted, you know, raises lots of obvious questions, right? Like, how are they gonna do it, right? Um, now, um, another thing that, that I wanna note is that the SEC is seeing like massive attrition right now. They have a lot of really unhappy people who hate Gary Gensler's stance on you know, regulatory enforcement like this. Lots of really good lawyers that have been part of the SEC for a long time who you know, wanna take these cases, um, you know, even really bad cases, they wanna settle them, get them off their books, and you know, drive policy forward in a very reasonable way, right? He, he's focusing on the wrong things. He's he, focusing on get, the wrong things. Get rid yes. of naked shorting and focus on that. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Follow up though, uh, a point to this is, is that think about who you're donating money to. Most definitely. And uh, you know, follow the dollars, because if you're, if you're backing the wrong side, you know, we, at, at some point we need something that's a functional system. Yep, mm-hmm, yep. Now, um, you know, donors and you know, origins of, of money aside, uh, Lummis in particular has been in the crypto industry for a very long time. I think she was part of like the third ever Ethereum roundtable or something like that. So her roots are extremely deep. She's been in this game for a long time, under understands you know, um, all the, the puzzle pieces the, and you know, pieces on the board very well. Um, and she's got really fantastic network connections. Um, the bill itself, you know, isn't perfect by any measure, but, you know, uh, considering where we're at right now, I think it's good enough. Uh, I, I hope that in some large respect it ends up passing, although I, uh, more practically, I think we're going to get stuck with many months of, uh, of debate and revision and yada, yada, yada. I, I think the problem is that it classifies it as a digital asset and kind of preemptively agrees on something that's not, not completely decided. I mean, it can be a currency. It can be other things. And I think, you know, long term, we're looking at serious issues trying to work out the entire industry if they just lock it down like that. Yep, most definitely. Well, and so, but my understanding is that the, de the default presumption would be that the digital asset is a commodity. However, should it show characteristics of being in security, it can be reclassified as such, right? Should it show characteristics of being, you know, more of a monetary instrument, um, you know, akin to a, you know, uh, a dollar or something like that, then it can be reclassified as such. So, um, but all of that is, is really important stuff that needs to be fleshed out in the final chapters of, of uh, before that bill actually gets proposed for, for voting. I'm not seeing any other hands up at the moment. Okay, so I got one in reserve for myself. Um, so about this time last year, we kind of saw a change in the crypto regulatory stance in China, which led to a mass exodus and a complete geological, uh, you know, sh geographical shift in blockchain production, right? The miners and the validators really all moved out and went to like, For Bitcoin Kyrgyzstan. in particular, right? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and then ended up in Kyrgyzstan, some more in Texas and other places like this. What I wanted to ask was what jurisdictions, because we've been very US focused throughout this conversation, what jurisdictions are you seeing outside of the US that you consider to be more crypto friendly? That's a very good one. Um, so certainly my, my legal focus, my professional focus is on the U.S. since that's, you know, where I live and where I work. Um, you know, I think we have lots of interesting, um, you know, jurisdictional pros and cons popping up in um, Central America, um, in, certainly in parts of the Caribbean, which have commonly been, you know, um, used to create Swiss bank accounts and have a bit more, you know, lenient financial regulation and reporting requirements and everything like that. Um, I think that we will see, start to see some safe havens in the EU, although the EU has taken a, a really poor um, approach to crypto and Web3, much more restrictive than the US actually. 
Um, so I, I think um, allowing those kind of you know, jurisdictional opportunities to, to actually continue in the EU is going to be difficult. Um, so I really think that the U.S. is going to continue to be the leader for financial innovation like this and the home to crypto and Web3. Um, we owe it to ourselves to do it. It's actually a matter of national security, if you ask me. Um, so there will be certainly other opportunities elsewhere, um, especially if you know, you're trying to maximize tax incentives and, and stuff like that. But um, if we can't do it, I'm, I'm not sure who's going to do it better. Phew. We made it. No, seriously, Colin is wicked, wicked smart on this stuff. He's going to be here for a little while. We're going to force him to walk around and have a drink. Uh, let's give a quick round of applause, and then you all can have a drink as well. Thank you. Thanks, Matt.